and welcome to the Rangers Rabble podcast. Actually, it's the Scottish Football Show, powered by the Rangers Rabble podcast. Shows you how long I've not been on for. Um, listen, we, we're on straight on after, obviously, the final whistle in Tbilisi. Uh, Georgia 2, Scotland 2, which we'll talk about, uh, as well as diving into some of the, the, the talking points that's been left behind uh, by the Scottish Premiership as we as we entered into this, this international break. Delighted to say I'm joined by two men who revel in this sort of stuff. Care, how are you getting on? Just time for that, Robert. So no bad, no bad. The grind doesn't it stop, does it? Uh, Connor no. yourself. Aye, aye, no bad, mate. Aye, as you say, the, the grind never stops. Um, but you know what? I'm fairly satisfied with that draw today, and quite looking forward to getting into some of the the topics of conversation. Uh, the night should be a should be a good one. Well, listen, we'll start with you then, because obviously myself and Kerr are in for work. Now, I saw the last 20 minutes on the television, but I was listening to it on on, on the wireless, as you say. Uh, you managed to watch the game. Uh, for what I sort of heard during the first half, um, Scotland would be just off it a wee bit. Um, frustrating first half. And, and you know, maybe summed up the fact yeah. that sort of John McGinn get nuts, gets nutmegged in the first half. So what did you think getting into half time, Connor, in, in, in terms of performance and, and what we're going to bring in the second half? Uh, well, God, the truth is that at half time, my initial thought was that's 45 minutes of my life, I'll never get back. Um, it was poor, you know, there's no doubt about that. Georgia were certainly the better side, um, carved out the better opportunities. I think the goal they scored, listen, it's a good goal, but I think we've got to do better. Um, and I think, listen, we, in many ways, we looked like what we were the night, which was a bit of a thrown together team because we're missing key players out there, right? You know, we didn't have. You know, Andy Robertson, we didn't have Kieran Tierney. Um, you know, you're throwing in Ralston, Taylor, players that are out of the back, McKenna. Um, so I think it just took a while to kind of, for everybody to settle down and get used to, you know, kind of adjusting to playing each other again and uh, actually figuring out what the plan was going to be. Because for me, the first half, we didn't look like we had much of a plan. It looked as if we were kind of, you know, we'll get maybe one or two half chances, we'll soak up a bit of pressure and all that kind of thing. I mean, and look, People can say what they want about it being Georgia, but Georgia are a far better team than you think they are. Um, you know, you might hear the name Georgia and go, "Ah, oh, well, you know, it's... But they, they, they've still got a chance of qualifying for the Euros via the, the Nations League because of how well they've done in that. So they've still got playoff aspirations of their own in there. Um, and apart from the, the game where Spain absolutely thumped them, um, 7-1 or whatever it was, they've been competitive and they've been more than in every single game they've played. So... It was never going to be easy. Get over there. Um, thankfully, though, I think in the second half, we had, you know, we upped the tempo a bit. We looked a bit more um, lively going forward. I mean, get the equalising goal, which I think is, I mean, Scott McTominay absolutely firing all cylinders right now. Um, you know, pulling the goals out at his backside for seemingly nowhere. Um, and, of course, we didn't, stay level for very long because again you know we allow them in well it was again a good goal but you know if you're being critical got to defend it better than arguably Xander Clark maybe could have saved it um that being said though I was a lot happier with the, the second half than I was with the first half um because the first half I was I was worrying I'm thinking his the three defeats in a row is that taking a toll on the, the confidence a wee bit even though it was against Spain France and England you know is that what's happening here? But they showed good character in the end. Um, and I think you've got to be fairly, fairly satisfied with, with getting a point, um, especially with some of the other point towards the waste of time in the book. And there was some meaty challenges, shall we say, that were coming in um, on, on our players towards the end of that game. Ken, I want to come to you on a point that Connor touches on, obviously, about Georgia and maybe them being seen as a, a, a football and backwater. But when you when you look at the, the stats there, Scotland had never had never won there. It actually never scored the goal in Georgia until tonight. Um, how much of it is that and how much of it is the fact that, you know, we, we've actually set the bar quite high over the last uh, year, year and a half in terms of performances and results? I think it's probably a bit of both, Robert. Obviously... I've done really any games easy in international football anymore. I think a lot of these countries used to think you could walk over the top or you can't anymore. 
because our coaching's a lot better than it was. I bring in better players through there. They've got a system in place. I bring in players through, whereas years ago they didn't. So you see how good some of the countries are getting. And I think because Scotland have qualified now, I'm not saying they've turned off, but we made a few different changes. A few players are still having to try to make their mark to be in the squad for next summer. So I think it's a bit of both. I didn't see any game. Uh, I won't use certain much annual leave to away for football and I wasn't using it for an international game. I'd rather use it for a Euro Europa League game. <laughs> Do you know that way? So, uh, so I've, if there's highlights on later, I might watch it, but I'm in my bed early. Week, weeknights, Robert, uh, school days and all that, so I'm in my bed early. But no, I think it's a bit of both. I think Clark's made a lot of changes, like Connor says, through injuries and just through giving other guys a chance. And George has still got a chance to qualify, so they're going to give it 100%, aren't they? But listen, two each away from home in a Europe, in international games, a decent draw, especially when you know yourself deep down, you've qualified. Connor, I'll, I'll come back to you, because it's an interesting point that, that Kerr makes in terms of already having qualified. So the manager had said, leading into it, you know, there was still loads to play for in terms of getting into pot two, um, which he's, you know, he's not going to come out and say he wants to get into pot three, is he? But looking at the face of it, there's no guarantees in pot two. Pot three looks the dare I say it, the safer bet. Uh, I think in, in pot um, pot two, you've got obviously you've got England, uh, but you've got the likes of Hungary, Albania, um, I don't know if it's Slovakia or Slovenia, so it's one of the S's over that way. Um, forgive me. So, you know, where, where do you see the, the 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 sort of the makeup of the manager in terms of is he going to be beneficial for us to be in pot two, or do we do we just ride our chances and see if we can end up in either of the pots? And I think he has went all John Gacy on his. Can you can you still hear me, hear me Connor? Oh, oh, look at the eyes there. That's a belter. <laughs> a few women, in, few women come on Nord have seen that face before. Um... <laughs> yeah, I need to buy the Nord VP at night because he's another different woman. <laughs> he does, aye. Uh, he's doing the okie okay with the mute as well. And out, and out. We'll wait till he comes back here. Um, listen. As, as we've touched on before, it's fantastic that we've qualified, right? There's no taking away for that. But I think lessons have to be learned from the last Euros in the sense that I think we, we saw getting there as a celebration, as the achievement, whereas now we've got to go there and, and try and do something, try and make a fist of it. I don't think you can look at that way. I think getting there is still the, I'm going to say the be on the end all, but I think getting there nowadays is... A lot of it, because I think once you're there, yeah, it depends what you're running in every game's different, but it's very difficult to beat some of these big countries nowadays at a different level compared to what Scotland used to be. I mean, Scotland had a lot of great teams in the past that failed in tournaments, didn't they? And this team's not to the standard of some of the teams they had previously, so I just think getting there is uh, you've got to celebrate it for going to a tournament, because it's difficult nowadays. There's a lot of football you play at national games more than used to be, and it's as difficult, especially the standard of play we're having, but They've done well getting there. But when you're there, depending on your group, you obviously try every game, but it is difficult. Well, but I mean, you know yourself, how many countries like you mentioned earlier, um, the smaller countries, as you would say, Georgia, the likes of that, you think, are they walkovers? But many times they have been somewhere and quid teams and thought we should have beaten this team and that team, and we don't. And then we get to play likes of Holland and stuff like that, and we do really well against them, do you know that way? So I think it's just getting there and taking a game to game. I think you can't do anything else, because but you're a small country. You don't get the same quality of players, so you just have to take game to game and depending on who you're up against. But you can't look ahead. You can look ahead to the tournament, you can't look further than the group stages at the moment. Hmm. Connor, did, did you get that initial question I asked you previously? You want me to repeat it? You went to the pots, or are you okay there? He's went again, isn't he? <laughs> this is turning into an uh, absolute fast. Well, I'll stay with you then, Kia, because you've got a reliable connection. <laughs> you have to get that guy up for you, don't you? <laughs> Just in terms of Scott McTominay, so tonight he's gone level with John McGinn and Stephen Fletcher uh, scoring the most goals in a qualifying campaign. I, I, I'll have to check. I don't know if, it, if it's Euros, a European qualifying campaign or just a qualifying campaign in general, but nonetheless, a marvellous feat. One more game on Sunday against Norway. Scores a goal on that, he will be the top goal scorer. You obviously see a lot more of Scott McTominay than most of us because you you, you follow Manchester United as well as the famous Glasgow Rangers. So, um, what, what have you made in terms of his role for Scotland compared to his club role? I think it's 
slightly different. And he's at United, he's probably playing with better players, but he's been asked to do a lot. Whereas with Scotland, he's been asked to do different stuff, get forward more. But you see that United, he's scored a few goals recently. But Scotland, his goal scoring record is really good, but he is better at the park. People think he's a defensive midfielder. He's not a defensive midfielder. He's more a central mid, but he likes to play between the lines, doesn't he? Between the front and the middle. And you see how well he gets into the boxes later on. You see how well he's, he is in there. But he's got a shot on him as well. And he's a forward thinking midfielder, and that's not what a lot of people think he is. But he's actually a very good player. Uh, he's got great coming in. I think that's why if he was up for sure, a lot of clubs would want him. Listen, these goal scoring records great. I mean, everyone he's hitting the whatever seems to be getting the back of the net, we'll all make it continue because he deserves it. Because he, he gives 100% of the game, good or bad. He never really, never really doesn't turn up, though. But if you know what I mean, even if he's having a bad game, he doesn't hide. He's always wanting to keep going. Mm. Listen, as you say, in terms of, I think it's mm. one to highlight, it's, it's those late runs to the, to, into the box that are, they're f- fantastic. They're reminiscent of a, of a Lampard at Chelsea in some ways. Connor. I hope you're back with us and you're, you're alive and kicking because um, we're going to need you here. You're the only man that watched the game from start to finish. So, yeah. just in terms of, we touched on there about the pots, okay, and it's, it's a, I, I want to sort of elaborate on another avenue because I think it's, it's, it's quite prevalent in terms of, you'd mentioned before, coming into this game off the back of three defeats, albeit England, Spain and France, three mm-hmm. of the guys that are going to turn up in Germany next uh, summer and, and, and really be sort of playing to, to lift that trophy come the end of it. Steve Clark has done a, a wonderful job, right, in qualifying for 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 the Euros, getting his to, to, to Nations League playoffs for the for the World Cup. Uh, so uh, playoffs for the World Cup, and then you know coming in and, and getting us to the the, the Euros so early in this campaign. However, do you? I'm going to go and direct. Do you see him as the man that can take us to that next level? Because we've got to start putting in performances against Spain and France and England if we want to progress in these tournaments. Um, what the fans are probably going to hope for when we get to Germany next summer. Yeah, listen, I think um, it's tricky. You know, obviously, I mean, listen, he did get that very famous victory over Spain at Hamden um, when we were just outstanding in, in that game. McTominay, obviously, at the double, as we were mentioning there, he's had the turnaround in, in Oslo, which was uh, quite something, considering that actually th- there was similarities to the game tonight in that one in Oslo where we just didn't play well. And in the last five minutes, we just flipped a switch, got ourselves a couple of moments and scored. So, He's got that in his, his background. I think what we'll see in the Euros next year is going to be the real witness test of him, I think. I think the last time out we got to the Euros, we were all happy to kind of be there. You know, that was that was the end. We hadn't been in a tournament since 98. You know, it had been 23 years. We wanted to see us in, in that, that tournament again. Um, it was unfortunate that we had two games at hand and we couldn't couldn't get a win. Um, and we obviously we had the draw. England this time round the test of him is he's got to get through the group because comparatively with where the, these groups used to be back in the day when you're in the Euros, it's a lot easier to actually get out of a, a qual out of a, a group stage in, in the European Championship simply because if you finish third, every chance you're going to get through. I mean, Northern Ireland done it back in 2016. They won one match, three points, and it was enough to get them through. Um, and we should be able to do the same. And the way I see it, regardless of what pot we're in, whether it's pot two or pot three, there should be at least one team in the group that we could look at and go, yeah, we'd fancy ourselves in a head-to-head with that 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 side. So that's the test for him is to get through. I think if he doesn't get through the group stage, then some questions will start to be asked because it will be, well, have we, have we really progressed? Because we've got to the same stage and the same things happened. Um, but Connor, just, just on a point you make there, is that enough though to say, Right, let's just say, I don't know, we, we get a Slovenia, we'll go head to head with them. The, the, my, my, my point is, you know, there is going to be a, a, a time in a major tournament where you're going to have to come up against one of the bigger guys, you know, yeah. a Germany, an Italy, whoever it may be, a Spain even, you know, and, and is Steve Clark, are we going to go into that with any any faith, any belief? I know we've we done okay over in Spain, um, up until a point. But certainly in in, in, th- in the three of those games, I don't think at any point we thought we were genuinely going to win those games. Mm. Yeah, listen, I think it's obviously... It's one of those ones because, you're right, we're, we are going to have to find ways of getting results against these teams um, when we're not in home soil. That That's absolutely going to be crucial. Particularly, I mean, if we draw Germany for talking sake, right, they're the host nation. 
So you're going to be really up against it, even though this is a Germany side who some would argue aren't as good as previous sides that have came before them. Um, so that that's that's the test is to make sure he he, he does do that. Um, I think I think he does have enough about him to do it. I just think sometimes where he's maybe fell short in certain aspects of these games is is decision making as the games are going on. Sometimes he makes changes too late in a game, um, and you think, well, we can't get back in it now. You know, you look at the Spain game. I thought we'd done okay over in Seville. My opinion, we were robbed a perfectly good goal, um, and who knows what would have happened if that goal stands. Uh, that being said, after that, we don't make the attacking change until we're already sort of two nothing down with a couple of minutes left to go. At that point, the game's done. So it's about having a bit more. Um, now it's about him to understand in those games you're going to have to change it quicker. Um, so, so that, are, you, are you saying? I will come back to you, Ken, in a moment. Uh, are you saying at the moment then, and tonight's evidence that bringing Shankland on was more a fluke? Uh, well, I think he should have brought him on 15, 20 minutes earlier because Lyndon Dykes was doing absolutely nothing in the game. Um, you know, he was anonymous. He wasn't really getting involved. Um, I think the the goal that scored by Shankland, I don't think if Dykes was still in the park, would have scored that goal because I don't think he gets up for that either. Um, so in some ways you could say it's a fluke. Obviously, there is an intention there. He's brought him on to try and get a goal and rescue the point, and it's worked. So you've got to give him credit in that aspect and say, OK. But again, it's about making those changes earlier because we could probably run on and win that game. I think if there's another 10 minutes left in that game at 2-2, Every chance we'd gone and won it because Georgia had started to lose their heads a little bit in that game. There were some challenges flying in that were, you know, amber cards, if you will. They were borderline for red cards, one or two of them. Um, and I think they were starting to panic because they were hoping for the third one as well. And then obviously, you know, we are putting the pressure on. So those are the wee aspects that we, we have to be better at, uh, especially in major tournaments, because you don't get... You know, games like tonight, if you turn up and play like that in a major tournament, you'll get hammered. We, we, you know, we've seen it against the Czech Republic, against Croatia. Um, you've got to be on it. So, you know, we'll have to see. And of course, beyond that, I think a lot of people would say, great, we've been in two Euros now, but the, we really want to be in the World Cup. Because obviously that's the big, you know, that's the big carrot that we all want is the World Cup. And we all feel disappointed in the way we performed against Ukraine in that playoff semi-final. Um, obviously, in the backdrop, everything that was going, we kind of made that feel a lot more of a friendly home game for them than we ever should have um, when we were at Hamden, trying to get into a World Cup ourselves. So, but I think he's the man for just now. Um, how long that lasts for, we'll, we'll wait and see um, how far we can progress. Because, obviously, you'd have to argue, I don't think there's anybody better placed that would take the job. Yeah, just on Lauren Shankland, listen, absolutely delighted for me on a personal level for Lawrence because I think he deserved that goal. Uh, he's had, he had a great season last season. I know he's maybe been a bit stop start this year, but I still think he's got a lot to offer in terms of Scotland. So I'm delighted he got his goal. However, you know, me and Connor spoke about this just before we came on air. Um, strange selection. Obviously, he's come in because Shea Adams has pulled out. The last couple of squads, there's been games where he's not even been stripped. And then as, as Connor alludes to there, um, he wasn't even, you know, he, sorry, Steve Clark waits and waits and waits to bring him on, he gives him sort of, sort of five, ten minutes at the end there. Do you think that, that goal will seal Lawrence's place in terms of getting to the tournament, or do you think he's still on the periphery here and, and Clark just doesn't fancy him at the minute? I think the problem with Shankland is a lot of managers don't make him as highly as fans do. I think they look at the whole picture with Lawrence and they think, the way I play, he might not suit it. I mean, the way we play Scotland, you see why she Adams and Dykes are there. I'm not saying they're better players than Lawrence, because Lawrence is a better goal scorer than both of them. But you see why they're there. We might have done it, the Scotland manager with Kenny Muller. You see why they play one man up front. I don't know if Lawrence could play that role himself. But you see, she Adams does it, Dykes does it, Kenny Muller done it for years. I think Lawrence is more of a striker. As you, as you see, he gets a chance, he scores. But I think Stevie Clark is looking at more defensive side of the game. And I think that's where Lawrence doesn't help himself. I'm not saying he can't do it, but I think that's where the manager's looking to say, now nah, rather go with somebody else that's more physical and stronger, taller, whatever. And I think maybe that's where Lawrence lets himself down. But 
with the goal scoring rate he does, he should be involved in the squad, he should be in the squad for the Euros. But just the way Scotland plays, am I going to be the first choice in the team sheet? In my opinion, no under Stevie Clark anyway. I think also, Rob, just to say, it's very difficult to slag Stevie Clark, I'm not his biggest fan, but it's very difficult to slag him for what he's done and what he's achieved as Scotland manager. And for what he gets paid compared to other countries and other jobs in football, is not a lot. So to get some deal should do better. I think you're, I think you're having a big reach there for no reason. I think to get somebody to come in and get do a better job, I think you'd be struggling to find somebody at the moment in time. And even if he did get as a better manager, you still get the same players to work with. I think the problem is Scotland squad. They probably played better than we thought they would. They're so overachieving. We, they're overachieving, right? They probably think they're better than they are. I. The bonus we listen. Some of the players can't. We know some of the players are really players, but other players in there who are hitting miss with their form are not consistent enough with it. And I think getting to Euros is still an achievement. I think that's the biggest achievement. Yeah, you can look and say we should be, and be like kind of said, finishing third and going ahead. But after that, I think we're not, we're not a big country. We're not getting to to go any further. Listen, I hope we do, but I don't think we can. But as for Stevie Clark, I think he's doing what he's been asked to do. And I don't think he can have any issues with him. I just think that's a way he plays. The defence are maybe manager because you know, his, his squad's kind of not getting the most gifted players in it. And I think maybe that's how Somebody like Scott with Tom, where he has kind of scored a lot of goals in it, because I think he's been given that role to go forward and have shots at goal and get involved more, because, but he also knows now, say, the game, he can come back and defend, and he's good in there, and stuff like that, so I think he likes players like that, whereas, as for Shankland, yeah, he'll score a goal, but will he run back 50 yards and put a tackle on, and I won't say he won't, but I just think that's where he must look at players. There's loads of good points in there, Ken, and I'm trying to set a piece of my head to get another question to Connor, so well, we need to move on, obviously, the, the, the Scottish Premiership stuff, but just, Connor, finally, because Ken makes some great points there, if you are going to go on and get another manager, then you're looking at that next level up, and that's going to cost you quite a bit of money. Add to that, then it feeds into, are we overachieving? And if we are overachieving, then the manager's got to take some credit for that, for probably building this sort of club mentality at a national level. But just on tonight's display, is there any players that have played themselves out of contention to go to the Euros. Maybe I'm talking like Greg Taylor or Anthony Nelson, as you've mentioned at the start of the, the show there. Is there anyone you think, because there's not a lot of places up for grabs, let's be honest. No, there's not. I think, um, well, I don't think there's anybody necessarily stood out that you would go, yeah, absolutely, he's played himself out tonight. I think Greg Taylor's an interesting one because I, I'm not convinced he will go. Um, I think if both, you know, Andy Robertson... Um, and Kieran Tierney are both fit. I don't see where you've hit Taylor in the squad because you'd, you'd have your eight defenders there. Um, and it is, you know, what is, it? is it a 23 man squad? I think it is you take. So you've got to, you know, places are at a premium. Um, and it's no because of the Rangers bias or anything like that because I do think Greg Taylor is a very good um, left back t- to have, but there's only room for so many. So I think he's one probably on goal. Ralston, again, as you mentioned, I don't think he had a bad game tonight, to be fair to him. I think um, there were one or two moments he could maybe have done better, but if we're being brutally honest here, um, it's it's Nathan Patterson who's actually at fault for Georgia's second goal. Um, he's allowed the man to come in off him instead of doing what I think more experienced defenders might do, and it's just a learning curve for him still, is you know, you've got to shepherd him down, keep him in his weaker foot and don't let him get goal side of you. He didn't do that. He allowed him to cut in and get a shot away. And it cost us. So, you know, again, I think maybe Patterson, Ralston and, and Taylor, maybe the thief from tonight that you would look at and go, somebody could nick their, their spots. Um, albeit I think Patterson's more likely than Ralston and Taylor to go to the Euros next year, I must admit. Um, but I, th- I just, I hope, I do hope, as you were mentioning the Shanklin thing, I hope he goes. I think he's shown tonight why he, He's got to go because he comes on, gets a couple of minutes, he scores. He's clinical that way. Um, I know he's had ups and downs in a Scotland jersey, but you can't tell me, <clears throat> and maybe I'm wrong, I'll you know, throw it to some people in the comments, there's no way Jacob Brown should be going in front of Lauren Shanklin because there's no way that he's a better striker at this moment in time than, than Shanklin for me. Um, you know, I haven't seen him do anything at um, Luton, I think it is he's at. So in that aspect... Yeah, I think Shankman's played himself in, and I think Ralston and Taylor might might be in trouble in terms of their positions. Final, final, final. <laughs> right. Just a yes or no, Connor, quickly. 
Shankland, does he start on Sunday? Yes. There we go. Excellent. Right, nice little juncture that. Um, if you are watching us on YouTube, like, subscribe. We need to do that. Need to do the house team. Um, as well, listen, get your comments in. There's a lot of comments um, coming in, but none that we can put up on the screen, David. Um, my friend. <laughs> um, yeah, lovely um, to have you join us as always. Um, actually, a nice wee juncture just to mention, obviously, um, the pod sponsor, uh, NordVPN. Uh, they are obviously official partners with the football club as well, Glasgow Rangers. Um, and the, with our sales, you get 63%. That's like two thirds or something, like um, Off a two year uh, NordVPN subscription, push by losing, using the link in the description. Just get below and, and get, get at that. Um, Connor, we are going to try and sort you out with that as well because it's brutal at the minute with you and that, that internet in that house. So, Anyway, on to the Scottish Premiership, because there's loads and loads of stories coming out. Um, but we're going to start with, with Connor's favourite, another man getting his jotters, as Connor would say. So, Ken, I'll come to you on this. Malky Mackay, um, sacked by Ross County yesterday that the news broke. Um, is it one you saw coming, honestly? It, we, when, the, when, the, when the final whistle went at the weekend, did you think, ah, he'll be away in that break? No, it wasn't. No, I thought they would get more time. So I think he's done actually okay there. He's made them difficult to beat. They're a good side at times to watch, but this season they've struggled. So I don't know if there's something going behind the scenes. Maybe he's asking for more players, maybe more money. And he's been told, no, you've got to work with what you've got. And he said, well, I can't really make this lot play any better. So maybe it's a case of that. Or they just said, listen, you took us far enough and we need to make a change because we need to get some points. Maybe I think a new manager bounce will help that. So... I don't really know what we're digging down. I don't know who's out here to go for. There's a few different names and branded about, but it's the same cul- usual culprits that get branded about. And that guys have been in a job before somewhere and failed and then you get branded the Ross County jobs. So I don't know who they'll go for, but I didn't see it coming. Hey, Robert North thought he'd have been given a chance to fix it, but obviously not. Listen, there'll be somebody in the comments before the end of this podcast touting Billy Davis. Please don't. Um, Connor, I'll come to you. Do, do you think... Um, uh, Roy McGregor has looked sort of over at St Johnston and seen that they pulled the trigger and they've got Levine in and they've got a bit of a bounce and they're making their way up the table and he's thinking, do you know what, I'll have a bit of that I don't know, I mean there might be uh, something to that I think definitely that result of the weekend will have maybe just, you know, sent a shower up his spine a bit in terms of obviously St Johnston have been poor this season under Steve McLean, they've been at the bottom of the table County would have identified that game going into it Eight without a win, they'd have thought this is a game for us to go and win. I get Levine's come in and the new manager bounce, but you know, it's poor. Uh, that result for Ross County. I think the interesting thing, I don't know if you've seen when I was reading about it, uh, Malky Mackay was adamant that they put out that they sacked him. He wanted it to be clear that he was sacked um, because apparently there had been a chat about you know mutual agreement and all that stuff. And he said, No, 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 I want it clear that I've been sacked. So I don't know if that says there's been. Maybe just a bit of a disconnect between Malcolm McKay and Roy McGregor over the, the course of this season, um, which is possible because if you're Malcolm McKay, and listen, I, I've actually got a soft spot for Ross County because I love that party, the, the country, um, and I, you know, I always like seeing them uh, in the league. Certainly prefer them in the league than Inverness, to be honest with you. Um, and I think he's seen a lot of players go out the door recently, um, big players for them. You know, you look at. Regan Charles Cook, for example, he was a huge part of them finishing in the top six. And you can't deny that's a hell of an achievement that Malcolm McKay um, brought for for County. And maybe there's been a frustration that he's not been able to get as many in to replace as, as he'd like to. I mean, obviously, he's brought the likes of Jan Danda. So, I, I mean, I don't know if, if that's been a part of it. I just thought it was interesting that he, he wanted it clear he was sacked. Um, who knows who to bring in? For what I'm hearing, it's... It's a shootout between Neil Wayne and Scott Brown at this moment in time. Um, that seems to be, they seem to be the two front runners. Um, would any of them do the job? Listen, I, if it was me personally, if it was to be between the two of them, I'd probably go for Scott Brown over Neil Wayne because I think one of the things County haven't done often enough is have that fresh, younger blood come in. You know, they've done it with Kettlewell and, and Stevie Ferguson when they were co managers. And although they went down, the two of them, you know, uh, Stuart Kettlewell, sorry, when he got the job on his own, done a terrific job in the championship and brought him back up. So we'll see what happens. But I suspect by the time the next Scottish football show comes around and the next round of fixtures, they'll have somebody in, in, in post. But yeah, it caught me by surprise, I must admit. Ken, I saw you wince when both those games came out of his mouth, but I saw you wince even more when he went for Scott Brown. So um, listen, 
Ross County don't seem to have on the face of it. They've got a decent squad for someone down the bottom, especially at the top end of the pitch. You look at Jordan White, Simon Murray, guys that have scored goals. Um, uh, Brophy as well. Uh, Connor Touch and Jan Danda for a bit of invention. Who can come in and get the best out of those? I know you say it's the it's the old, it's the, the old name certainly, um, but who can come in and, and give that a lift and, and get them going again? That's up there, Chairman, isn't it? But I wouldn't I wouldn't be going for a new way. I saw Brown. I think Brown eyes on the chance at Fleetwood, but. Kind of flatter to deceive, didn't he? When he's done it and seen it and made an arse on a few occasions, so I wouldn't be going for new Lennon either. So, listen, there's managers in the championship, there's managers in League One he could go for, guys who are in a job at the moment. I don't know, maybe he doesn't want to spend any money and say, Do you want to come and try it? Young guy, young manager, I mean, there's, I mean, there's a boy at Air Trick, I remember his name used to play with us. Uh, he, he's McCabe, yeah. There's other guys out there he could give a chance to because it's a it's a good job to have. I mean, to be honest with you, they should have sacked the boy Kettlewell, but uh, they did. So, uh, I think they made a, a balls up for that because you can see how well he's doing at Motherwell. I just think sometimes clubs want to be bigger than what they actually are. And like you see, I kind of agree with you, Robert. I, I think he looked at St. Johnson and thought they were doomed and they thought, no, Levine, who don't know how he got that job. He must have had something someday at St. Johnson, but he got the job and He's actually done all okay cases in there and Ross County is now starting to panic. I think that's maybe one of the reasons maybe Malky and the chairman's had a words and he's left and I try to bring some in just to get that bounce to get other points back because before that everybody would say St Johnson were down, didn't they? But now it's kind of are starting to panic because other clubs are picking up points. So I don't know where they go, but I wouldn't go for it. I would go for somebody either employed in a championship, a league one or Somebody else, like, don't just go for names because they're big names either. Something that doesn't work. Go for somebody who's actually good at coaching and who can play a decent brand of football. Don't go for somebody you know, who's been there and done it. Or let's get Scott Brown because he's a big name. Doesn't work for me. Just I'll open this up to both of you actually because it's an interesting point you make, Ken, about picking somebody for the lower leagues. However, you, at the same time, these chairmen are thinking we can't afford to drop out this league. We can't. So maybe that's why you get an appointment like a Craig Levine. Um, where they go for that experience, somebody can keep them up. Um, we'll talk about Craig Levine in a, in a, in a moment. But, but to, just in, t- in terms of the appointment, is, is, is Roy McGregor going to gamble and go for a Scott Brown who maybe no get that experience in terms of managing in Scotland? Or, or, is, he gonna, or is, it gonna, is it gonna be a Neil Lennon who has done it at other Scottish clubs um, and then can keep them in the league? I think, just to, to, to caveat that by saying, I think they're very fortunate how poor Livingston are at the moment. Um, I don't see I don't see anything from Livingston that's going to suggest that they can um, or Davy Davy Martindale can resuscitate them this time. I think they they look um, sort of on a, on, a, on a one way trajectory downwards. So um, I think the manager, whoever they choose, they've got that on their side. But certainly, I wouldn't fancy Ross County at the minute in a playoff. No, you would be, you wouldn't. But then they they've had a knack to be fair, Ross County are digging themselves out. I mean, you look at you talk about playoffs. We were hunting them when they played Partick Thistle. Maybe they really fancied them getting into that. Thistle was going for fun. Won the home leg, 2 nothing. Wait, one nothing up at Dingwall, 3-0. You're thinking, County are dead and buried here. You know, it's back to Fur Hill for his next year. And all of a sudden, County produce what I would consider has probably been the best comeback we've seen in any of the playoffs so far um, since they've, they've been introduced. So I would never rule them out. Um, I think it's important, obviously, that they get the decision right. I just think, you know, I mean, like Neil Lennon, as you say, Derry, has been about. He's got a good bit of experience. Um, you know, we might, as Rangers fans, have our own feelings about Neil Lennon as, as a manager and stuff, but you can't deny he's had an impact at the clubs he's been at. Certainly when he went to Hibs, you know, they were playing some brilliant football, particularly his first year at Hibs. They were, they were really good. Um, we was going to come off a bit after that, but, you know, he has that about my only question mark about him going to county is it's a different type of sort of feeling up there with their kind of fan base. I'm no sure they'd want a manager that would bring the kind of you know fiery style, shall we say, that Neil Lennon has got about him because he does, you know, he's passionate, he wears his heart on his sleeve, but he goes over the line sometimes as well. And county, you know, places like Dingwall aren't really looking for that sort of thing, whereas I think Scott Brown, considering it would be his first opportunity, might be a bit more reserved in that. But look, <clears throat> whoever they get, it's going to have to work. I don't think, I mean, listen, could they go down a Craig Levine route in terms of somebody like that? 
Maybe, but then I don't know who you would bring in because who's out there that is of that ilk? Um, so I mean, they've, just, they've just missed out on Ian McCall. I see he get uh, appointed at Clyde, so that's a, that's a big yeah. one. <laughs> he did get appointed at Clyde, which is <clears throat> a surprise. That That is just for anybody who doesn't understand that, you know, Clyde and Patrick Thistle historically do not like each other. That would be like Rangers appointing Mark Minnell. That That's what that would be well, like. Let's open that can of worms right, Connor. All right, let's well, no, I'm just saying that's what that, you know, so you can picture why that is not a great idea. But anyway, aside from that, um, you know, it may be that they do that. I'm looking at the championship managers going, mm. I know there's been other names you could look at, but they look at a Neil McCann, maybe, you know, for a safer pair of hands um, to come in and just sort of steady the ship. Because he did that at Dundee when he first went there. Um, maybe even the guy that followed him at Inverness, Billy Dodds, you know, I don't know. It's It will be, all these names will be mentioned and I'm sure they'll be spoken about by Roy McGregor. So what you're telling us, it will be Billy Davis. That's what you're telling us, aren't you? Um, okay, listen, it'll be interesting to watch that wonderful news you see. Our next Scottish football show, I'm sure we'll have... I think somebody in the chat was saying Michael Beale. Could you imagine? Oh, no, I can't see that. He'll have, he'll be, he'll have ideas in Barcelona, him. I don't know, Michael. Um, okay, Craig Levine then, uh, Kerr, um, obviously gone into St. Johnston. Got them motoring, as you said, sort of touched on there. We had them down on this show a couple of weeks ago. Um, but Steve McLean got sat with ah, that's the end of the way. They'll never, they'll never, they'll never pull that back. Nicky Clark seems to have come back at the right time for him. Um, got him a couple of goals. And as we've said on this pod so many times, goals are so important down the bottom. See if you can get somebody and get you 10, 15 goals. Um, vital in the, in the bottom six. Yeah, it is. And listen, he's done really well, isn't he? He brought Andy Cup him as well. And Andy Cup's a good coach, so. That was a good appointment they made, and the mention managers there. I mean, Calm Davison's still out there, so he'd be a good bet for straight for those I think St. Johnson had to do something, didn't they? And I think Levine's, and I say, I still don't know why, but I thought he was comfortable where he was. I thought he'd finished managing, and we all know that I mean, in Scotland he was a bit of a joke, but he done well with Hearts when he was here the first time, that's a good, a good few years ago. But he's, and he's done okay, he's got him winning games. I'm not going to say he's going to set the hell on fire, but he's done okay. He's got what he wanted, he's got the bounce. It's when he loses one or two, it's to interest to see how he goes in because we know Craig can be stubborn and we know he likes to play no forwards at times. So we we'll just have to wait and see how he works out. But no, he's done well in there. But like I say, he's probably his best saying Craig have been there since he's been there with Andy Kirk. I think that's a good appointment. Connor, just just on Craig Levine in terms of you, you know we know he's he's lifted them up and they're, they're, they're sort of moting their way for for the bottom and, and that's all well and good. However, speaking to Hearts fans um, who have sort of mixed reviews on Craig Levine, they say the true test is when he gets a transfer window with January looming. We know St Johnston won't have a you know a a, a wheelbarrow full of money. He'll be sort of dev, delving into the, the loan market and, and free transfers. How important do you see his, his dealings in January being in terms of how he if he keeps the job long term? Oh, massively important because that, that's a team that, that need a, a couple of players in the door desperately, even if it's loan deals that they have to go for. Um, and they probably ideally want to offload one or two as well. I think there's a few there that just are up to the mark anymore. Um, you look at Stevie May, you know, guy was a, a legend for St. Johnson. You can't d- dispute that, you know, the things he's done, won trophies with him. However, his time has passed. And I think if you can get somebody like him out and bring a bit of a fresh impetus up front. We've seen County do that themselves um, with Simon Murray coming up for the championship so they might look down that kind of route and, and see who's there that they can bring in. I mean, talking about Airdrie, you've got the boy Callum Gallagher, Airdrie and he seems to be really doing well for them this season. Um, you know, you've got a whole host of others as well and, and so they might look there but I think that'll be the test for them because um, that's his opportunity then to stamp his authority, his style in the team, you know, his players, because um, I always feel sorry sometimes. I mean, we all agreed, right, that Stephen McLean had to go. Unfortunately, it just wasn't working for him. But he might sit and see Nicky Clark coming back and going, I could have got the results if Nicky Clark was back in my team while I was there. You know, I've been hampered by these injuries. So you, you have some sympathy that, that they've been unlucky. Like that, I think time will tell. I think January is important for Levine. That will make or break his tenure there. Because um, let's not forget, he did get Hearts relegated the last time he was in management. Even though it was a season being curtailed, they were never digging themselves into that hole that they dug themselves in. And he knew that. That's why he was trying to blame other other excuses. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see. 
Kerry, nice little, nice little sort of caveat as you said, uh, Connor, because uh, I'm going to go on to the other end of the side, Hibs. Hey, Montgomery, um, listen, you, if you're watching the show and you watched the show previous, a bit of a different format, because you know, it's Thursday night, we're a wee bit away for the weekend. Usually we review the game, game by game, play by play, but I just thought, we're a wee bit away for the weekend. It's probably um, been parked here on the Scotland stuff, so I'm just going to talk about some, some talking points tonight, and we'll get back to the usual format after the national break. Um, Hibs... You know, they get that win against Kilmarnock, who you have to say were sort of flying high, you know, in terms of picking up results and, and, and building up the table. Nick Montgomery stopped the plane out for the back. Do you think last Saturday was a was a, was a, was a sort of a, a reward for, for sticking to his guns and, 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 and keeping to his principles? He did go in there and say that, didn't he? Was only changing and then the players are coming out to see you know, getting used to what he wants them to do. And listen, you can see when the play does, it was different. You see, they were getting caught at times, but they were trying something. And if it did work, they would end up doing really well. And he's done that. And listen, it's going to take time. He's a new guy in a new country. He's getting new players there. He's not not knowing and he's getting used to them. They'll probably try and bring in a few players in January, maybe more in the summer. But I think he's trying something different. And I think the Habs fans will probably enjoy watching it. I think some of the players will enjoy playing it more. So you're playing a long balls one, something like that. Chasing things and they don't need to chase. And... As a better way of playing football, obviously you need the players to do it at times, and that you, you will get caught there, and, and you, you know that. But it was a good result against Kilmarnock. Kilmarnock do do well. But I know a great side away from Kilmarnock. They're better at home. They get a lot of results at Rugby Park from the travel. They've been struggling for some reason this season, so it was a good result for Hibs. And I think the, he's done really well since he's went there because he's that's he's coming to a Scottish league where he doesn't really know a lot about it because he's came to Australia. People are putting on. Uh, was an Australian manager, he must be half decent. It doesn't always work that way, so he's got a lot of pressure on him. And he took over for Lee Johnson's a totally different guy for Lee was, and I think the players are responding to him better. And I think he's got his play I see a better brand of football. And I will be the refreshing for his fans to see, but I think it's encouraging to see and it's courageous as well. I manage to come out and say, I know it's not working at the moment, but I'm gonna to stick to it because I know it will work. Listen, sometimes they fall on their own sword, but at least he came out and told them what he's going to do. And listen, I'm always say I hope it works for me because I don't really want to have one I lose. But it's good to see somebody's coming in and trying something totally different from what we usually watch when we see Hibs. Listen, you've got to remember this guy's coming to a, a squad that when he can't make any changes, you know, got a transfer window. Um, so it's down to, we always say about, you know, the two test of manager, if he, if he can improve players, can he make players better? Well, he certainly made Tavares better, Connor. He was out in the cold, um, in from Benfica B. Um, it looks to be a decent find and, and a, a guy that's played his way into contention. Absolutely, listen, he's that you know Tavares. I think, as you say, um, bit of a out in, out in the cold and maybe written off by by some people, um, but more than proven that there is a, a quality player in there. Um, and they need that because the thing is, with a special style of football, he likes to play. And <coughs> listen, as a, as a football fan. I enjoy that style of football, I enjoy being a bit more expansive, let's try and go on the front foot, let's go after them. Sometimes you have to, you know, take a step back in certain games and and not be overly stubborn and, and recognise maybe you do need to change sometimes. Um, but you need everybody motoring and firing in all cylinders when that when you're playing that style. And I think Tavares is starting to do that. You know, Martin Boyle, we know how good Martin Boyle is um, and how important he's been for Hibs. Uh, I think he would maybe do himself a favour by keeping himself on side a bit more. Um because that's a few times recently. Um, you know, but apart from that, no, I I think he's certainly got a lot more out of them than Lee Johnson was getting um in a shorter period of time. Obviously he'll have tough games to come. I think it'll be interesting to see how he sets up when he comes up against Rangers and Celtic again. Because next time he plays Celtic it'll be at Parkhead and he'll obviously we have to, you know, travel to Easter Road, so it'll be interesting to see if he changes anything there, or even in the, the Edinburgh Derby that will be at Easter Road, because those are the games that some people might look at and go, you can't just go hell for leather, because you'll get turned there. So, we'll see, but I, I quite like what he's doing so far. Right, listen, we are very sort of positive on this podcast, we always talk about up manager, I think we've talked up um, Stuart Kettle at one point when he was in a good run, we've talked up Derek McInnes, and we've certainly talked up this season care um, Stevie Robinson, but you know, have the wheels fallen off there slightly? That's a massive, massive result of the weekend up at Dens. 4 0, scudded, as we'd say in this part of the world. Um, 
And listen, credit to Tommy Doherty because he's he, he, Tommy Doherty, so he's, he's team up in the, the, the top six, just promoted. Usually, that's you know their hot favourites to get back down. Does not look like it's going to be that way actually um, this season? Um, but Stevie Robinson, maybe food for thought there. But you know, there's work still to do. I think he always knows there is work to do. So I'm on a next green a forum, and they were always going to lose at some point. Man, they're always going to take a goblin at some point because you usually do because. A few of my mates are some fans and they, they couldn't believe how well they were playing at times and how how they were winning games they weren't expected to win. So I think it was always in the background. Stevie will just dust himself down, dust their cars down and go back to basic, just some of them. Listen, someone's always hard to beat, I think. A lot of times this season, they probably won, like I said, games that they didn't expect to win. But when the play does, I think they get found out a wee bit. I think when they play against Hub recently, I think it finished two each and they were, they were unlucky that night, but so were Hub as well. So it was a bad result at Den's part, but then D have had a, I know we beat them quite easily, but they've actually been playing okay, then D, and they've got a few boys on their side who are good footballers, I think. Someone turned up and just then they start well, and then D just capitalised on that, and someone couldn't get in the game at all. And I will be a setback for Robinson in a way, but he's probably just said to himself, listen, we're better than this. We know we're better than this, but we're just going to have to go back to better bases at the moment. And get this out of system come our next game because I think they will. But it just shows you how sometimes the teams in the league are maybe apart from us and them across the city. The rest of the teams in the league can beat each other on their day. That's how close some of the teams are in the SPL. I know you've been sitting like bottom or you can be third, but on their day they can all beat each other because there's Wait, not a lot in this league. Okay, that should be a, a unique selling point of the league that it's so topsy toughy, it's so tight. Um, and I don't know why we don't pull on that, um, but we, you know, we'll probably. Knock our heads against a bit. We'll keep talking about that. Connor, just to come back to you, Kim, it's a great point there about um, Dundee and, and some players they brought in. Bakayoko, we've we've touched on him a few times here, just in terms of showing a wee bit of promise. And you know, we've just seconds ago we mentioned how, how important goals are in this division. If they can really get him moting, um, how important could he be in terms of maybe dare I say it, pushing him into a European place? <laughs> I tell you, listen, stranger things have happened. Um, it wouldn't be the first time. But weird scenarios like that have, have occurred. I mean, look, Bakayogo has had a good start of the season. I think he looks a, a proper good striker. I um, mean, you touched on it earlier, the importance for teams like that to have a striker that can get you 10, 15 goals a season. I think he gets you that no problem. I think he probably gets you 20 um, if, if you can get him properly firing. Um, I mean, most weeks when we are doing our predictions, I, most people have him as their first goal scorer for Dundee, um, which is a measure of how well he's doing, to be fair as well. that That's, you know, you recognise that. Um, I, I think what might slightly just hamper Dundee a bit for, you know, that kind of ambition is the players around about them. But there's still, you know, one or two that when you look at some of the other teams that they'll have to kind of toss away and get results against that they don't quite have the quality of. I mean, that was a great result against St Mirren, but... I'm thinking, can they go and get results like that? Not necessarily for now, but get results against Hibs, against Hearts, um, you know, because they're really, they're the teams that they'll, they'll have to take something off of as the season goes on. They can forget, you know, Rangers and Celtic are, they're basically eight games a season, they're eight free hits. If they get something for eight, any of the games, great, it's a bonus, but they're not expected to. Um, that being said, though, I think, uh, to go back to back of Yoko, he, he's a handful for, for anybody, and I think he's one to really keep an eye on. Um, this season in terms of the, the goal scoring charts because I think he'll certainly be up there um, towards the top half of the, the top goal scorers um, even if they're not Shades of shades of I didn't know you were going to finish there I thought you were going to carry on and you stopped it um, <laughs> Shades of uh, of Nubly for last season Kev, I think we, we back a Yoko and we saw how he's fell off a cliff this year and now whether that's because he wanted a move in the summer and, and his heart's not in it, but he's, he was a massive, massive player for Levy last year, and this year he is he, he's nowhere near it. He yeah, is no, no, he's but Levy as a team are nowhere near it. They're not playing the same. No. The team don't look they don't seem to play the football. Levy and we're always in your face, Robert. They're always pressing you, we're always hitting you, they were hitting you in the break with the big, big, big boy new play, but this season you've not got that. I don't think there's getting about my agree with you. I think there's a danger they could get something in the allegation if not maybe in the down, depending on what they do, but they've not got a lot of money to spend there in Martindale. But he has, but every, I mean, there's been strikers coming to this league and play well one season, the next season they don't play the same. It's just the consistency, and that's probably the reason why some of them are in Scotland, because of the consistency 
and that's a level. But he's done well back here because since he's been at Dundee, but it's still only November. Wait until maybe January, February time and see how he's doing. But at this moment in time, he's done well. The, the boy like McCowan done well. There's a few other players that done okay. Tony Dogg, he's done okay there. I have to say, I didn't think he would do as well as he had, but he's done okay. But like I say, he's been sitting six just now, but come February, March time, he can be sitting near the bottom of the again because a few bad results push you down the way. But it just shows you because it's only like a couple of ago we all thought about I'm sitting third, I think. And now with a couple of bad results. I mean, come on, let's be in that position as well. So you have to take every game that comes in this league, especially when you're at one of the clubs, because you can go for a good result to a bad result within seven days. But there'll be a few players we'll talk about this season that's going to hit highs and lows. But big new play, he probably, they're probably not moving. Did, didn't help him. He probably didn't see him a half, but he probably thought, I mean, I'll get that chance again. And the way his form was going, he might not get that chance to that move to that club. So I might have to maybe just go on a freebie or go somewhere different because he's, even against us, he didn't have the same intensity in his play. I thought he was really, really bad against Rangers that weekend. Connor, to, to touch on Livingston, um, and this is me just putting two and two together and maybe getting, you know, 16. Um, but Davey Martindale, you know, care, care touch there, Levy don't have a lot of money, but they went out and brought Allo as manager. Brian Rice in as a I don't know as a coach a number three I don't know what his what his role is there however and I'm sort of thinking because I I genuinely don't think Davies looks hungry this year I think he looks fed up um there's been you know after games where I've just thought he's no at it and maybe is he thinking well is it bringing Brian Rice in because he's going to make an exit at some point and and Brian would step in there. I think there may be something to that. Eh? Um, I think you have to. Look, Martindale's been at Levy for so long now, you know, doing loads of different jobs. And he said, what is it, four seasons now as, as manager? You know, eventually that does take his soul. And I think he's obviously just at the point this season where he said himself at the start of the season, they basically didn't have any money to spend. You know, they were struggling to get players in the door. Um, you know, that being said, they did still get one or two in. I mean, they did get Mikey Devlin in um, and place a Nicky Devlin. So, you know, um, <clears throat> they were able to do bits of business like that. And I think there's a general frustration that comes in and you, go, you you want different challenges. And I think he feels that he's earned the right to get a, a, a better opportunity. And I would agree with him. I think I was disappointed that Livingston um, refused to let him speak to St. Johnson. Um, now, Obviously, if he really wanted to, I'm sure he, he could have pushed harder and said, no, I, I want to speak to him. So maybe that wasn't for him anyway. But he's probably looking at it and he recognises, you look at Hearts, for example, I don't think Stephen A. Smith's going to be there till the end of the season. You know, he, he will be one of the next managers to be relieved of his duties, no doubt about it. Um, so maybe he's thinking, well, when something like that comes up, maybe that's in the back of Livingston's mind as well. He's not going to turn down that kind of opportunity. Brian Rice... So ready made replacement and he's a safe pair of hands in terms of he's he got the experience, he's been about, done that way with Hamilton, for example, in the Premier League. Um, maybe didn't quite work as he'd have liked it. So it's an interesting appointment because I don't know what difference he'll make. Because in terms of his philosophy and how he likes to play, it's not that different for David Martell's style of play, what Brian Rice usually does when he's he's been manager. So I I think there might be something in that sort of we've got a replacement already there should Martin Dale go. I think sometimes Connor just on a different voice in the dressing room can make a sight different to players because some players can make it yourself. You've been listening to me for four years. I'm just a nice and like a broken record to someone bringing some down. will be slightly different idea just a different voice, mm-hmm. different listening players may actually listen. I don't know, I'm just surmising but sometimes you know yourself, if somebody talks to you that much you eventually stop listening and just hang for a gap. Well, the thing is, though, I mean, Livingston have had strange sort of managerial situations before. I mean, I mean, was it David Hopkins brought them up and then left after getting them up? You know, he, he didn't get sad. He just he, he resigned and ended up in uh, Morton or something like that, which is when Grant Holt came in. And that was a bizarre situation. And maybe that's part of it. Maybe he thought, right, I've done as much as I can. I'm, I've, I've had enough now. But maybe Martin Dale's getting to that stage of his tenure where he's thinking, I, I'm, I'm, this might be my last season here. You know, so David Martin Dale won he? Want to ask for a move just because how much Livingston has done for him as well? Ah, there's got there's got to be something in that because obviously they've given me some opportunity. Yeah. But uh, you know you're, you're on about you know the uh, St John the, the the chairman knocking back an approach for St Johnson. 
when you, when they show his face at the weekend, the new owner, he's probably going to think, I wish I'd taken that, them up on that opportunity because they look absolutely devastated. Um, I listen, I, I don't think they'll sack David Martin, I don't think he's done too much for him, but I do think they, are, they just look absolutely doomed and it all hinges on maybe through Ross County at a point and if, if the, the new voice of Brian Rice can get a lift. It's an interesting one, really, because I, I do like David Martin, but I know I see every new voice that fed up with me. Uh, talking so um, okay listen I know we've, we've rattled on a wee bit but we need to talk about Aberdeen we have to talk about Aberdeen so Aberdeen um, had a, a tough night in in Europe <coughs> uh, Celtic Park and Celtic obviously had a, a rest on the Wednesday night um, so um, yeah Celtic take six off Aberdeen Connor six now mm-hmm. we touched on this before we came up on this uh, podcast Kerr touched it as well um, you know Celtic no they're going to have an easy afternoon when Aberdeen come calling. Yeah, unfortunately, that that's proven to be the case more often than it has not to be generous, shall we say. I mean, look, I think it'd have been one thing, you know, there were three half and down, granted, the last, you know, you know, any stoppage time, um, which incidentally was what I predicted the score to be, so they done me at the points as well. Um, but, it is, as Chris Boyd said, and I think he was right, it's an embarrassment to fold in the way that they did and end up getting hit for six. You know, losing three goals in the last seven minutes in stoppage time, that's not good enough. And to be fair to Barry Robson, he did say that himself. Um, I think, obviously, a lot of people put some a lot of stock in what Boyd said in terms of really we'll not have a problem getting them up for the next game because Rangers are in town. There's definitely something to be said for that because they obviously view us clearly is more a rival to them and, and more a derby, shall we say, than, than maybe they do Celtic. Um, I, I mean, I, to be honest, I don't actually think Boyd should have said that, given that he's in that kind of job uh, as a punter professional. I think maybe that you, maybe just everybody knows that, but you don't necessarily need to say it. So I can understand maybe why some people would think it's over the mark for him to say it, but he's not wrong. Um, and the stats bear it out. Um I mean, you can make your mind up. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the stats that I know that I looked up. Over the course, I think, since about 2008, so in the last 14, 15 years, Aberdeen have played Celtic 77 times. Now, that is more than they've played us. And they've taken 28 points for Celtic in 77 games. That's not good enough. They've conceded 161 goals as well, which, again, is unbelievable. When it comes to Rangers, conversely, we've played them 56 times. Because obviously we had sort of the build on this year's where we didn't play them at all. And they've taken 50 points off us in 56 games. Now, a lot of that comes down to how poor we've been in some of those games. As we know, the Michael Wheels last game, absolutely atrocious performance. And we should be able to beat Aberdeen regardless of how well they play and turn up. But it does show a pattern where they seem to, they seem to perform better when they're playing us compared to Celtic. I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's partly to do that they see Celtic as a, a, a bit of a bogey team for them and there's a mentality issue there. Um, that being said, how many different players have come in and out over the years and had the same problem? It's... I, I don't think anybody's ever surprised. I don't think you look at Aberdeen and go, yeah, they'll take points. And it's disappointing because I said, I think any league in the world football that you look at, the team who are the third biggest team in the country, which Aberdeen... Purport to be, and to be fair to them, they, they are. And you look at just in terms of the history and trophies and stuff, they are. You would expect that the third best team should on any given day be able to take points off anybody in the league, including the two teams above them. Because um, it happens everywhere else. You you know, look at England. Whoever's sitting third will beat Arsenal, City, whoever it is. You know, they, they all beat each other at some point. And Aberdeen just don't do it when it comes to Celtic. And I don't, I don't know why. I think they need to really have a word with themselves. Um, because that at the weekend was, it was a, a absolutely, it, it's worse than just the usual Aberdeen performances that you see against Celtic. Listen, you see those stats, by the way, absolutely fantastic. A big Mark is watching, you know, rabble, rabble uh, legend. That's how you do your research, Mark. Um, okay, just Barry Robson, sort of weeks leading up to this, um, this, this fixture had said that after Frozen, oh, well, we're in Europe, and we're, you know, it's, it's hard to come back. They didn't really pull up any trees in Europe. I know they played well in patches and matches, but they never really pulled up any trees. And I kind of thought that we kept rolling out that excuse. But he did he did 
to say it was unacceptable after the game and Sunday. I suppose there was no hiding place um, when I was listening to his, to his post-match. Is he one that should be really worried? Because that, that was a bit of, I know he done well towards the end of last season. They've come up, sort of got a point to me on a full-time basis, but it was a bit of a gamble for the Aberdeen manager. We consider how much demand comes from the Aberdeen support in terms of finishing third. What kind of demand for Aberdeen support? Aberdeen support to me, though, but there's a different support and it was there under, under Sir Alec Ferguson. Under Sir Alec Ferguson, they were winning things. They were coming to Glasgow and beating anybody. They weren't just beating us, they were beating Celtic as well. They were winning the Scottish Cup, they were winning the league, they were winning European trophies. Since then, and some of their minds just all think they're a big club, but they're not a big club anymore. They've got history, but having a history doesn't mean you're a big club. And you look at Man United, for example, not a big club, but they've got a history. I think it's Aberdeen fans' problem is if they beat us, they're happy. They don't care about the rest of the season. If they beat us, they're happy. It's hated. And the hatred doesn't just stand for Neil Sims thing. It stands for before that. But it's hated. The fans will come to Ibrox. They'll sing and dance. They'll be happy when they beat us. They'll feel their way sex in Ibrox. They don't feel like it's Celtic Park. Or Park Head, as people call it. They don't, they don't feel up there. Because they know I'm going up there. Why would I travel to Glasgow to get scaled? I'll just sit in the house, see the result, and then go to Ibrox the following month. Do you know what I mean? It's the way they are. We've got there. The dodgy feel, but they don't feel it against them because they know they're going to get beat. And it's just the way it's always been. I'm not saying that, I'm not sitting here saying the poor double to lose because no football player kind of does that. I mean, unless you're into the betting scandals, but I'm not even sitting here saying that. I think it's just the way Aberdeen are. I think they put more thought and effort and all the kind of strength into playing us. The fans demand it, so they have to show it. I think the board probably tells them that this is your most important game of the season, Rangers, home and away. It's like the cup final demanding more tickets and then selling to Rangers fans. Did you get yours, Robert, by the way? I was just asking if you get yours for the Aberdeen end. <laughs> but, you know, I, and I, I'm not just saying this. I know Connor said that he didn't like Chris Boy saying it. Chris Boy was only saying what everybody thinks. And why should you not say it? Are you now having to watch what you're saying on TV? Chris Sutton says things nobody bothers. McFadden says things nobody bothers. But as soon as Boydie says something that's a big issue, no issue for me, just telling what everybody else knows. You and Cameron done a podcast in Aberdeen. He's a Hearts fan. Saying we all know Aberdeen only turn up four times a season. And he was right, they do. And it's, if I was an Aberdeen, if I was an Aberdeen fan, thankfully I'm not because I've got brains, but if I was an Aberdeen fan, I would be gutted if my team only played well against one side, but every other game I went to the lat. Are we trying today? Are we going to win today? But against Rangers and the lat, I know we're going to get 100% here. Because that's the way it must be. You'd be totally gutty. Would you buy a season ticket for that? Because I certainly would. Well, listen, this this kind of makes my next question redundant, Kev. But just a, a one more answer from you if, you, if you wouldn't mind. Week and Sunday, will we see a reaction from Aberdeen? <sighs> the bear's shit in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> okay, dokie, that'll do me. Listen, just to finish um, the pod uh, on a sort of a more general note, boys, because it's something I wanted to delve into, and I know we're sort of short in time, but just Scottish clubs in, in, in Europe in general. I know Celtic won six uh, on Sunday, but obviously they took a, a real dismantling in uh, in Europe midweek. Let's not hide away for Rangers taking a dismantling the previous season as well. You know, just in a, as a as a as a general conversation, is it can we keep throwing? Well, it's the, it's the money corner. It's it's the pound signs that's making the difference because you look at. Again, sorry for come for you again, Kerr, but Kerr's Man United, they went to Copenhagen, who I'd say have probably got a similar budget to Rangers, if not maybe smaller, um, and they've yeah. offered us all on, on a European night. I don't think you can just put all the eggs in the basket and say, no, oh, it's finances, it's money, because results like that, as you say, have happened. Obviously, there were circumstances, shall we say, in the Copenhagen game in terms of, you know, Man United with 10 men, um, which may or may not have been a harsh red card. I think it was a red, but some people think it's hard, so fine. Um, so that that can happen, but we've disproved that ourselves. I mean, we knocked Dortmund out on a route to Seville. And you can't tell me that they don't have a vastly superior budget um, than we do. Of course they do. Um, but there's also the fact that, take take that aside for a second, right? When you look at the group Celtic are in, the top seed in that group are Feyenoord. Feyenoord have a turnover that is virtually the same as Celtic's. Their budget is no you know, higher than Celtics at all. It's, it's virtually the same because they're in the Dutch league and all the sort of stuff that comes on with that. So the, the money they get isn't, you know, blowing Celtic out of the water. Um, Celtic financially are actually in a very decent place. Um, and I think, you know, 
what both clubs have been guilty over the years when they, they throw that argument is being slightly hypocritical because all the smaller clubs or every other club in Scotland can make the same argument and say, well, of course, we're going to be able to compete. Of course, they're going to win everything because we don't have the, the budget. So we can't go and beat them. You know, they, they blow us out of water. And yet we see it all the time. So I think, yes, you're going to come up against teams that are just better than you. You know, Atletico Madrid, it, it's slightly, I think, sort of uh, deceiving that they weren't in the top pot. Atletico Madrid, because they definitely are the top team in that group. There's no getting away from that. The likes of Griezmann, Marata, players like that, we know all about Simeone and how he likes to play. So it wasn't a surprise that happened. But we still can be performing better in, in Europe. I don't think, and I don't like this either, because people go, oh, well, you know, you're having a go at Celtic. But look at over the last couple of years. Celtic haven't won a knockout stage game in Europe since, what, 2006? You can't tell me in all that time they haven't had ties that they probably should have won um, and got through. They have to perform a lot better than they do. Um, and so do we in, in certain aspects. Again, we got thumped against PSV in the qualifiers for the Champions League. Um, and listen, we had a whole podcast about that and debated the rhymes and wrongs about that. You know, So we're not immune to it. But I do think we've proven over the last couple of years that you you can beat teams regardless of the budget that they've got. It's a smoke screen they use to excuse getting beat because our top two, just to finish on this point, for me, Rangers and Celtic shouldn't be getting six or seven put past them by anybody. I don't care who they're playing. They should be better than that. They can lose games, but they shouldn't be getting pumped six, seven and half teams in, in Europe. It just shouldn't be happening. Okay, just final word on you because it's, it's an interesting debate in terms of well, I'm going to use Celtic here because... Obviously, they do it quite a lot in terms of buying um, project players, as it was, um, spending two, three million on a player and looking to develop them and, and you know make money. And that's something they've done, and it's a, a business model they use. And you know, I'm not going to sit here and rip that to pieces. Um, however, is there an argument that, that, that if they spent the money on a, on, a, on, a, on a bigger player that was maybe I don't know eight, nine, ten million that was ready to go in, would they would, would they see a marked improvement in the Champions League, or is, is there more to it than that? Is it the fact that? Brendan Rodgers is going in and trying to play toe to toe with him. Barry Robson's going in with the likes of Pauk, etc., which is probably a similar level in terms of budget for Celtic to Atletico, Pauk to, to to Aberdeen, and, and trying to go toe to toe with him. Is that the is that the problem here? It's the mentality, not so much the quality. I think you could probably put it on a different camera, show, but I think you can see that they're not getting the same ability of players. They're not getting the same money as some of the clubs, but. That's an easy excuse to use, isn't it? As soon as you beat the team in Europe, you say, well, you get a bigger budget. They may have, but over 90 minutes of a football match, anything can happen. If you say you're still up well enough and you watch that team enough and you tell your players what you're doing, anything can happen over 90 minutes. Obviously, unless you're playing some like Man City, who are just going to blow you over the, out the water anyway. But it's just, it's difficult in Europe. Listen, I, personally, I think the times are the Rangers and Celtic and Champions League coming to an end. I think, one, I don't think we're good enough to the Champions League. And two, I don't think they really want it anyway. But I do think Europa League, Europa Conference League is their level. I think they've got a chance of getting far in both the competitions. I'm not saying we're going to win it, but we were very close. But I think they've got a chance of getting far. Whereas the Champions League, yeah, you can make money, but you get hammered. And I'm not saying I'm going to sit and enjoy the last time we were in the Champions League. They were, I was gutted the games. Especially the Liverpool game. You know how much I hate Liverpool. But especially, especially that game. I just... It's not something you enjoy, and but you're going to go because it's your side. But I would rather play in Europa League against teams who had a very good side. You mentioned Dortmund. There's been other sides. and But we know we went to the game, they've got a chance. And you've seen how well we've done since Cologne came in. You've seen the other night against uh, Prague. And I'd rather go to the games. Yeah, it's not, as a, it's not a limelight of Champions League and stuff like that, but we're in it and we, can, we know we can go far because of the quality of play we have. But as a Champions League, I don't think any Scottish team ever going to go for that anymore? I think getting in it's well, like Scotland getting there is an achievement, but after your group stages, you're probably going to be either in one Europa tournaments or just out all together. Like probably Celtic will be this season, and it's no great for our league because you want to go far in Europe, so you're better sticking to Europa League or Europa Conference. Listen, brilliant. Um, I'll just sort of finish that off by saying I think Hearts and Aberdeen, so 
over the last couple of years have been fortunate to have that fallback of the conference and get straight in the group stages. Um, I do think that we do struggle in, in qualifiers as a nation of clubs. Um, but listen, we'll save that chat for another day. Brilliant shift, boys. Really enjoyed that. Um, time flies when you're enjoying yourself. Cheers for the comments as well. Um, David, you settled down towards the end of the night, so really keep that up. Some sensible stuff coming out your mouth towards the end of that podcast. Um, we'll be back, I think, we'll be back Monday night for the, for obviously the Rangers content. We might do something Sunday, just depending on how things go with Scotland. Um, but listen, enjoy your weekend, folks, uh, and we'll see you on the other side. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure.